Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. If you've listened to our show in the past, you may know that I've interviewed several mediums. However, it is my experience that our guest today is one of the very, very, very best in the business. And why I say this is just a couple weeks ago, she gave me the most detailed evidence and a lot of it about my life and my folks in the afterlife. So I'm sh- I am thrilled that she's here with us today. Her name is Suzanne Wilson. She's an evidential medium, intuition development expert, and spiritual teacher. She has been tested, verified, and written about in books and scientific journals by world-renowned afterlife researchers. A natural-born medium, Suzanne hid in the psychic closet for many years while she had a successful career as a corporate executive and university director. We'll have Suzanne tell us more about this in the interview. Today, Suzanne's clients include celebrities and diverse people in countries all over the world. In fact, she's the medium noted in the book called Liberating Jesus by Roberta Grimes. Suzanne is the author of an upcoming book titled Soul Smart, What the Dead Teach Us About Spirit Communication. Suzanne has a bachelor's degree in management, a master's degree in public administration, and lots more credentials. And most importantly, she is a certified specialist of wine. I love that about her. She lives in Carefree, Arizona. Uh, She's got a husband of 28 years, and you can contact her at carefreemedium.com. So I've said more than enough. Suzanne Wilson, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you for inviting me. It is an honor. Ah, thanks. And as my listener knows, when I get really excited, I get tongue-tied, so I <laughs> messed up your introduction in the bit, <laughs> beginning, but I'll edit that out so it'll sound very good. It's Suzanne, the spirit energy. Is that what it is? <laughs> it can be. It gets it, it, They drain batteries, and they use whatever they can around them to manifest. I can feel them all around us as we're speaking. Oh, that's awesome. I have a big smile on my face. I've got that little kid at Christmas feeling. When I know there's just presents to unwrap and they're just so close. So how about a little bit about you? You're in Arizona. Uh, Always been? No, I actually grew up in a tiny little town in the Midwest in southern Illinois where my granddad was the preacher in um, the biggest church there. And um, I closeted medium himself. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. And when I was this weird little kid that would get beat up on the playground because I'd go up to another little child and say, there's a lady behind you. And, of course, it was a spirit lady. So when the child turned and saw no one, they turned back around and knocked me down. Um, My granddad was the one who really helped me to understand that this was not something that everybody had and that it was normal, that it was from God. And that was helpful, but... I did not want to be an unusual person. So as you mentioned in your Mm -hmm. intro, I hid in the psychic closet for a long, long time till the universe gave me a wake up call. Wow. And and what kind of jobs were you doing and how, when did that uh, wake up call hit? Well, you know, I figured out early on how to work with people and how to be politically astute. And I knew how to make money. I had an education. But I found that I didn't really enjoy making money unless somehow I was being of service. So that started me off in government and education. And um, I look back on the diverse life experiences I've had. And I realize, you know, none of what any of us do is ever really wasted. Because I work with clients today that I can speak their language, which is really helpful. But it wasn't really until a near-death experience that I decided that this would become my life full-time. Wow. What happened in your near-death experience, may I ask? Oh, sure. I mean, it was very, very strained. I was just getting allergy tests. And so I'm in a doctor's office. And how long are you going to die when you're in a doctor's office? If they can bring you back, they'll bring you back, right? Right, right. So I only had a minute. I had anaphylaxis. I was having allergy tests. And I was telling the technician, I'm getting hot, I'm getting nauseated. 
And she said, oh, you're fine, you're fine. I said, no, 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 I'm really sick. And then all of a sudden, my throat was closing, and I was literally honking like a goose. Mm. And she left the room to get help. So everything slowed down in very slow motion. The few seconds that I had out of the body before the epinephrine injection and the paramedics came was amazing. What do you mean? Well, first off, I saw the physical world around me from a different perspective. At the moment that my throat closed up, I stepped backwards and up out of my body, and I felt arms wrapped around me. Everything slowed down in the physical world. I saw two doctors. I saw two technicians. They were holding me up by the arms. Apparently, if you lie down with anaphylaxis, it, the whatever is in your bloodstream gets to your heart too fast. Mm -hmm. So they're holding up this limp body that's not breathing, and they're moving so slowly. It's like um, one of those movies where you everything, like they shoot the bullet, and the bullet goes really, really slow, right. you know, like in a matrix. And I thought, oh, well, they're taking forever. And what are they doing? And while I'm bemused at what's happening with my body, I hear this amazing music. Oh, this music. I want to hear this music again. It's like thousands of angel voices. And they sound like instruments, but they're voices. And they keep, if you're musical at all, you'll know what I mean when I say that they're um, major keys and very comforting. And it keeps going up and up in waves. And I then I realized the arms around me were that preacher granddad of mine who oh. I loved and lost as, as a kid. And um, just as I'm about to really travel, I could see that that epinephrine injection was getting ready to go into my body. And then I heard a voice, no idea whose voice this is, a masculine voice saying, your work hasn't started yet. And then I'm back in my body, and it's very painful going back in. Mm -hmm. Do you know what, though? I want to tell you something. I'm not sure if I've told this before. I'm going to be very vulnerable with you here. Thank you. I did come back changed. I came back changed in that I was in a corporate job for a, a $5 billion company in a corporate headquarters HR position. And I didn't want to be that tough corporate woman anymore. I wanted to love and hug everybody, but there's something else. I came back feeling like heaven's reject. They didn't keep me. They didn't want me. Oh. This terrible, crushing depression. And I never hear anybody talk about coming back from a near-death experience and getting depression, but I can't be the only one, don't you think? You aren't. I've talked to, I think, four people on this show that they usually tell the rah-rah that they want to help people. But first, they've said that they went into depression. One guy actually got suicidal because he just wanted to go back. So it's not just I you. can understand that. Um, yeah, if I didn't know, yeah, I can definitely understand that. But I'll tell you, I needed that wake-up call. Mm -hmm. I needed that wake-up call to take assessment of what's important to life. Uh, I collected a lot of stuff. Um, and stock options and all of that. And I realized that by putting myself into hiding and being ashamed of the abilities that I had, I was denying my own soul what I came here to do. And I would just continue to be like beating my head on a brick wall to make other things happen. And, and I could always succeed at everything I tried if I stuck with it long enough. But when I started doing readings for friends of friends, it was effortless. And that this is the only work I've ever done where I feel completely and totally free. And because of that depressed feeling that I had and that why did heaven not want me, it forced me to figure out who I really was. And instantaneously when I started being who I really was, the fear and the shame of being different melted away. And I knew what I needed to do and that it wouldn't be easy and I would lose friends and relatives along the way. And I did, but I have so much more now. Wow. You just said just denying your soul what it's here to do. That Those are some pretty profound words. 
for and it could be anything it could be you're here to be a teacher in some way not necessarily in a classroom although you could be you could be modeling the way for people you could be a counselor you could be a great single parent um everybody has a calling no matter what it is and you know you're in it when you feel so free I've had times that I felt free and other times I haven't. So I know what the freedom feels like, but getting into it is where it's at. Yeah, work wow. is work. You might as well do what you enjoy. Right, exactly. Wow. So I'm a late bloomer, I guess. And I think probably a lot of listeners out there are late bloomers mm-hmm. too. And you know, it's like you figure stuff out. You figure who you really are. And I didn't want to be a woo-woo person. I mean... You go to school and you amass all of the student loan debt in your education, and then you want to be a psychic medium? Right. What? (laughs) Um, But, you know, it comes down to one thing. Are you going to figure out what you do well and leverage it to bring a little bit of heaven to earth, or are you just going to bitch and moan every day about what you don't have? And it's funny because we have a culture, and especially, I think, in the United States, of comparing ourselves to others. Yes, we do. But when you write, when you get a wake-up call, though, you realize you can be happy for other people. I, I don't want to compete with other people. I want to figure out how I can help them to even do better. That rising tide lifts all boats. I'm just... I'm talking to you and I'm writing the book and I'm doing all these things besides I could just be in my office and just work with clients on the phone or see clients or whatever. But I'm reaching out because part of my life's mission is to touch as many people as I can to let them know it's okay to really be you, to be yourself. Use your abilities to help yourself and to help others and bring that little bit of heaven to earth in the process. That's so sweet and so true. And I love that it came out of your toughest time. Heaven's reject. It could be a title of something for you. I know (laughs) for me, when my dad died, that's the thing that cracked me open to this world that I never thought I'd be in. And I turned 50 in a month and it's like, I'm like, how can I be turning 50? But Suzanne, it feels like I'm moving into like the absolute best stage of my life and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, that's what's telling you to keep moving in the direction that you're moving. Yeah. And it's, we have either in a gut, in the gut of the body, the solar plexus or in the heart, the chakra or energy center in the middle of the chest, you're, most people are either driven by one of those places and you can sit with a decision of where you're headed in your life and hold it like it's in your hands and either put it to your gut or put those, your hands to your heart and say, is this the right decision for me right now? And you can train yourself to feel that in your body. Now, you, I feel like that that's something you're naturally doing. You feel in your heart chakra for you because you're definitely an empath. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Hey, you know you what? So. That's a good thing. Yeah. And I mean, you want to turn it into an asset. It can be a liability too, because you can be like a sponge and take all of the moods, feelings, emotions, and sometimes even the physical ailments and pick those up from other people and feel them like they're yours. Hmm. But it can be an asset because you're able to really read where somebody's coming from and know how best to interact with them right. um, and it can be an asset in many respects but you know gosh I hope it doesn't take a near-death experience for people who are listening to wake up and be true to who they are I don't think it does I do think that we each have a little voice in our head that tries to convince us that this life is all that there is that life after death is impossible that we're victims in our life And for whatever reason, we all have that voice. I don't know. But I do think whether it's listening to a show like this or reading empowering books or if you have an opportunity to talk uh, with a good psychic medium, any of those things can 
kind of be the wake up call that you no, know, you don't have to die <laughs> to to live. Right. Right. You just have to get really, really focused and in the moment. And that's why I'm so happy to see the raising of the consciousness that I feel is going on worldwide right now. Right. They, they, things are changing. Meditation is not a foreign word <laughs> to people. I know a lot of people that meditate on their breaks at work now. And all the meditation is, is being in the now, the present, this moment, at the center and zero. And that's when you get the best information from that inner voice that you just mentioned. Yeah. Suzanne, can we just get into maybe a couple of examples of why you believe life after death is real? I mean, I spent an hour with you and wrote down four pages worth of stuff that there's no possible way that anybody could know. But nobody's That's eavesdropped right. on that conversation to know th those things. And um, I can even give one of the examples that you and I spoke about is um, mm -hmm. many of our listeners know that I'm a chef and I work with race car teams and um one thing that you said in in our conversation is you saw Paul Newman, the actor, float in mm -hmm. and tip his hat to my mother. And nobody knows, or very, very few people know, that uh, Paul Newman used to race cars, and my mom did his travel, and we cooked food for him. And so it was so appropriate. And it was just like, cool, <laughs> you know. Oh, and, and he looked amazing yeah, good looking man <laughs> yeah but so well, many see, that, things that's it that that's the whole thing right there it's it's the evidence right it's the evidence okay so if i'm sitting and picking up on uh, feelings and things like that okay that doesn't really convince me of anything no this may surprise you to find out that i am a skeptic but i am an open-minded skeptic. Okay. The reason that I am convinced there is an afterlife goes even beyond my one minute in between worlds where I'm just getting ready to go there. And by the way, I didn't even get there. Um, oh, gosh, you can still pick up a little far grapes on that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't get there. But I visit with the people who live there, the dead community, every day. And I'm convinced that it's real and not that I'm crazy. I may be crazy, but not about this, because they will give evidence that are little details that you can't Google, you can't look up on Facebook, and God, that's annoying that people would think I have time to do things like that, but the dead will always figure out what it is, what that little thing is that they want to give that will have so much meaning, like for you and your mother. That's what it convinces me, and it's thousands of readings with thousands of souls from the dead community over and over that people cannot debunk, that convinces me. That and the fact that I can see them, hear them, feel them, smell them. How, so do, you, that. how do you see them? <laughs> Is it in your mind's eye? Or are they kind of outside of your vision? Oh, I love that question. Do you have a okay, good answer so, for that question? You oh, love? gosh. Listen, <laughs> I, I, you know what? I'm... I'm really surprised I didn't get committed to some kind of institution as a kid because as a kid, I saw them like people 100% of the time. And you don't want that later in life. Well, I guess you don't want it at all because it's scary. Sure. So, right? Somebody just pops up in front of you. It's like you're going to have a heart attack. Especially if you're alone um, in the house. I couldn't imagine right now I'm alone in the house oh, and somebody walked in. All, I had all the time, all the time like that. Mm. Now, I would say about 90% of the time, I'm seeing them like it's a daydream, like it's a flash in my mind, and only maybe about 10% of the time do I look at them and see them as a person in the room, and I have been fooled a couple of times by, I thought I was really talking to a person and it's a spirit. Most of the time, it's like a real quick flash, and sometimes I don't see them at all. It's what they're putting their energy into. That's what I'm going to get. Hmm. So they could be sending a thought, sending a visual. Yeah. Lots of pictures. Um, my head is a giant database that they can root around in and search and find a memory of something I've experienced 
or something I know about and show it to me in pictures or give me the feelings to get their point across to you. Sometimes I can hear them. Sometimes I can taste the chicken and dumplings that grandma <laughs> made. <laughs> or I can smell the apple pie. Um, it's whatever they're focused on. And it's not always what the client is expecting. You know, um, I've had readings where I, I'll go 50 minutes, we're coming to the very end, and then I say something else at the end, and they say, oh, that's the one thing I needed to hear today. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, you know what? You're lucky you got that because this is about what they want to talk about. Rather, you're my client, you pay me, but I really work for them. So it's what they want to talk about and how they want to do it. And they actually study and practice. There are places in really? the dead community. Oh, yeah. I, I want to hear more about this. Blow your mind. Okay. Oh, it's, yeah. This is why I have to write a book because they keep showing me these places. And like I said, with thousands of readings and I get good um, evidential information from spirits. And all these spirits, they don't even know each other, but they're all telling me something. I start to believe what they're telling me, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. So here's what they're telling me. I've heard different names, but the most common name I've heard is we have halls of reunion here. Halls okay? of reunion, okay. Halls of reunion. And in these places, there are different rooms where the dead community can go. And they can practice and learn how to come into a dream visit, how to merge their energy with a bird or a butterfly, how to give you a sign. And they have teachers and subject matter experts that help them do this. And why not? Wow. Yeah. They're working as hard at it as we are. I can't tell you how many people have asked why a certain loved one hasn't come through or what they're doing wrong in a reading that no one's come through or someone's just passed and you know what's happening that they haven't come through and i don't have the answers i really don't and i don't know if anybody actually has all the answers but it it gives me a good feeling that they're they're just maybe not there yet or that they have to want to, because we retain our same personalities, don't we, to some extent? Yes, and all of our memories, too. We still have the opportunity to learn and grow if we want to, but we don't have to. But there's a number of reasons why a certain spirit wouldn't come through in a reading or um, why you haven't gotten a sign or whatever. Do you want to hear some of them? Sure, absolutely. I, I had a feeling you would. Well, it's because you're well, the first like thing medium. Is, <laughs> right? I know. I know. It's so exciting. It's so fun. Yes. The first thing is they may not want to come in because of the fact that at this point in your life, they'd be too tempted to tell you something or say something, and they need to be hands off and let you exercise your free will. Really? Okay. Okay. Like, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until after so-and-so's asked her to marry him. I know it's going to happen, and then I'm going to come in, and I'm going to come to the meeting. I'm going to say, congratulations. Yes. So I'm going to hold off. I'm going to hold off. Or you're getting a reading, and somebody else has information that the group in their pre-meeting has decided, oh, you need to come through with that. We're going to put all our energy into you coming through and communicating today. It could also be... They're busy. They're not floating balls of light doing nothing over there. They have lives and, and interesting work and all those sorts of things. And then finally, it can be that they're studying, they're getting ready, or your grief is so strong that the grief is like putting up a big brick wall between the worlds. And so they're going to have to wait till you're not grieving as hard. So lots of reasons. Don't blame the medium. Don't blame yourself. Don't blame anybody. Just be patient. Wow. There was a girl um, who wrote to me that wanted to commit suicide, and she hadn't heard from her brother, who was in the hereafter. And her grief mm -hmm. was so strong, and I did everything I knew to do to encourage her to talk to somebody, and, you know, not just me. Um, but I don't know where this came from, Suzanne, but I said, well, if your grief is so strong 
you're not building up the good feeling energy in order for maybe him to come through. And all of a sudden she was mm-hmm. shocked, like, what, what do you mean? I said, well, your tears are keeping him from showing himself. Well, what can I do? You know, so I gave her some practices and things to make her feel self feel better. And even though it was hard and I got an email from her that said, like, she knows hands down, her brother's around. She like wanted to keep on living. Oh, this, mm-hmm. He had some really weird song that he loved that like is never played on the radio. And she heard it all the time. She heard people humming it. She heard like, it just, it, it, it was it was him and a few other things happened but um intuitively i you know i told him that and and sure enough like it saved a life and if we can save a life by talking about life after death that's important that is fantastic oh just want to hug you right through the phone but you know a couple things about that first off where that came from in you that information of i don't even know where this is coming from but i'm gonna say it it's your memory. It's your memory of when you're at home. In home, of course, oh. I'm talking about the other side. And you just tapped right into it because you needed to. It's a soul-to-soul thing. Mm-hmm. But the thing about suicide is that when we decide to leave early and not finish our program that we've lined up for ourselves in our planning, mm-hmm. we get there and we realize it would be so much easier if somebody would be mad at us and judge us like we expected, but they don't. What do you we mean? judge ourselves. You come to you, you commit suicide and you get there and think, Oh, okay, no, I'm done with that life. I don't have to deal with that. Okay, who's gonna be mad at me because I'm gonna defend why I did what I did? Mm-hmm. And they just come to you with love and they say, Look, you know what? Um, rest now. And when you're done resting and you're ready to come out and assimilate in the population with us and be part of the community again, we'll talk about what happened and what you're going to do and when you're going to go back and how things will be different. But for now, you poor dear, you need to just rest. And I've had people come through and say, I was mad that they weren't mad at me because I had my defense all lined up. I knew there would be an afterlife. I go to heaven. I get away from this life. But they're telling me, number one, I'm going to have to do something similar in a life again and go back for my growth if I want to, and I will. And number two, nobody was mad. Nobody judged me. And it's like it diffused me. And then I realized on my own, I'm the only one that judges me. And then you, then they want to renegotiate. Oh, can I have a do over? Can I go back? And then they realize the people that they killed themselves. Maybe they were looking forward to seeing oh, I'm not going to see you for a while because I'm going to spirit rehab where I'm going to rest and learn to love myself again and forgive myself so I don't ever take my own life again. It's, it, there's, no, there's no real bad news for the person that commits themselves other than the fact that um, you don't get the do-over, but you will get the start over. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. And I, I've had people say, well, especially grieving parents, and I work with them a lot, they'll say, I've, I've got to, I, I just don't want to do this anymore. I can't get over this. I'm going to kill myself to be with my dead child. Well, you're not going to be with them for quite a while because you're going to have to, like, Monday morning quarterback why you made this decision, and you're going to have to go to a healing and a resting place and a lot more education. And it's like, wouldn't you rather just arrive home in the natural time and the natural way that your soul's plan is about to unfold Mm -hmm. and then they'll have a big party for you and you'll be together then um it's i'm glad that you were able to tap in to the information to give that person to get her own signs and symbols because suicide's never an answer to anything no i have a friend whose son just committed suicide no 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 nothing was living a happy life and oh she's just tormented the mom just and she believes and in an afterlife. Fine. Yeah. Right. He's fine. He's in he's in a great place. And he may even sleep. It's sort of, it's, you know, the only time the dead community ever says to me that they actually sleep is when they first get there. If they've had uh, a long illness, like a horrible cancer and chemo and all that, um, or they have been shocked by their death, like somebody's hit by a bus. They'll tell me when they first got there, they slept quite a while, so they couldn't do any signs or dream visits for anybody. 
And with suicide, they tend to rest for quite a while. But he's fine. He's fine. And they'll, they'll be together again. And I'm sure you've reassured your friend. Yeah, and she knows. It's just living through grief, no matter what you believe sometimes. Yeah. It's, the body needs to do what it does. And the pain it can be tremendous. Yeah, and it's not about getting over it. You're not going to get over no, it. you're going to get through, through it. Yeah, that's it. a better way of saying it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And I think with anything we go through in our life, when we look back several years, you know, <laughs> in the future, it's like, oh, I needed this for me to be here right now and yeah. be doing this. And it may not make sense in the in the meanwhile. So where should we go now? Should we talk about what you talk about in your book or what your passion is? Yeah, and I'll tell you, I, I would love that. And it's really, I'm telling a story about what the dead community does to communicate with us from their perspective. Okay. So that we can better understand that it's a two way process. You, okay, so you, when you die, you don't become all knowing. In fact, nobody's all knowing except the creator in my book Mm -hmm. you so you don't just arrive there and all of a sudden know how to make contact with your loved ones and i've mentioned the halls of learning but there are also people who are really anxious in the dead community to let the living community know they've arrived and they're doing great and they're still part of their family's lives one of the things that's easiest for them to start with is merging their energy with a small um, animal, like a bird or a butterfly. Okay. If you, do you get bird and butterfly symbols or in, in signs yourself from any loved ones? Um, you remember, I don't remember readings afterwards, oh, although no, I can't okay. forget Paul Newman. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, for with my grandmother, I see dragonflies. I think it's oh, my grandmother, that's but that's always when I think a Grammy is a dragonfly or sometimes a butterfly. Okay, so let me ask you, when it's happening, when you see the dragonfly, is it at a time where you were just thinking about her? Um, sometimes. And then, and then some, other times when you see it, how do you know it's her? How do you know? There's just this instinct, gut instinct. Yes. And there's a red Beautiful. cardinal, too, when I think of my grandfather. Oh, I love that. Yeah, there's a red cardinal that's, like, right outside my window. Okay, so you get the dragonflies or the cardinals, and it's either at a moment you're thinking of that loved one, or you see it, and immediately you have a powerful instinct that it's them, right? Yes. Okay. So you, the difference between you and the people who say that they never get those signs is that you trust your instinct. Yes. I believe everybody gets those signs. Everybody. I don't think anybody gets excluded from that because it's the one thing that the dead community tells me that means the most to them is that they've got to send a hello. Okay. They've got to say, I'm still here in some way, and it's the easiest way. And how they do that is pretty remarkable. In the halls of reunion, they will teach them. It's like almost being backstage um, at a Broadway play rehearsal, there's a stage, there's lighting, there's energy, there are in what we would call angels and um, other expert spiritual guides that are there to help. And they'll say, okay, so we have a volunteer cardinal here <laughs> today and we're going to practice. And now you've got to get your vibration together and you've got to focus and remember to ask the, the birdie, before you merge your energy, say hello, make a soul-to-soul connection, and ask, may I merge your energy with yours to give a sign to my loved one? And the, then this cardinal opens up its aura or its energy field and accepts the energy of the dead person, and they share that minute of joy, and they practice. So it's not a spontaneous Thing like we think it is it's like they're looking for these opportunities and they're rehearsing and focusing isn't that amazing 
It is totally amazing. I'm I'm doing a at home study course on mediumship right now, <laughs> and one of the right. one of the practices is first meditating, but then seeing my own soul, my own power, envisioning a light of like the spirit world, and merging, and then asking God or the divine, however you want to call it that we can merge these energies and like turning up my energy and it's it's just making me laugh because i'm doing that on earth right. and to picture them exactly. doing that the year after doing the same thing and we're we think we're the only ones we think it's so easy for them and, and then and then some people take it to the next level um some of the living will be i need a sign every day I need a sign. Well, you had a great sign last week. What is this? Like your crack habit? I mean, do you understand how hard this is for the dead person? And, you know, um, when we are demanding signs all the time, it's just like running up to somebody's house and ringing the doorbell and running off. Um, be patient. And when you do get a sign or a dream visit, just pause and give gratitude because gra gratitude will beget more uh, of the same. But, yeah, it's work on both sides of the so-called veil. That's so funny. You know, um, my skeptical mind is kind of stepping outside, like, are we really talking about this? Is this stuff really real? I know. And then I think about, like, I have an iPhone, right, that I'm looking at, and somehow this isn't connected to anything, yet invisibly it can pick up signals and voices from all over the world now i have no idea how that works but it works so mm. we don't have to know how spirit communication really works to trust that it does work you know what i'm getting at yeah exactly it's interesting that you would bring up a uh, phone um also because I, I, you probably heard that there are people that are working on something called um, a soul phone, which is a way to use electronical devices to be able to communicate between the worlds. And in fact, um, Dr. Gary Schwartz is um, working really hard on this, and he coined the term soul phone. Sonia Rinaldi in Brazil has already had excellent results, but the communication is in Portuguese. So it's not heard of a lot in the United States. Hmm. We have My not talked being, about that on this no. show. So and you know what? Oh, yeah, would, that's a great topic, a really good topic for you. But my point being is that spirit will literally use everyone and everything that they can to manifest the energy vibration to make the communication happen at our level. Um, they'll drain batteries. They will um, cause electrical surges. I've had blackouts um, in the house where the night before I'm going to have a reading with a really powerful spirit. Um, this one uh, young lady blacked out my house and my husband and I walk outside and look around. We're the only house in a block that has no power. Um, and I see this woman walking in my house. So they, the, the dead community has told us the ones that are working with us to help us make the soul phone work and other communication methods like this, that they literally have an infrastructure like we do. So it's sort of like, and I'm speaking euphemistically, it's like in the dead community, they are laying the fiber optic cable for us to be able to communicate between the worlds. I'm not speaking of physical cable, right? but because there are laws of... Um, Physics are quite different from ours, but they're working and we're working and it's two teams coming together. I wouldn't be surprised if, um, I hope this happens 100 years from now, but if 100 years from now you can text the other side just from your iPhone, wouldn't that be cool? That'd be outrageously cool. And what do you think will happen to the world if instead of like you missing your dad, that you could call him? and talk with them every Sunday, if everybody would be able to do that with their loved one, how do you think that could change the world? I mean, just a gut reaction. Well, I know for myself, if I'm not afraid of dying, I'm not afraid of living. That's it. Yeah. And so oh, I could kiss you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hug you. Thank you know, you. I have to tell you, that's the whole point. 
we people who are afraid of death are really afraid of life. And when we have this communication between the world where we want it to be, I see us giving up war. I see us giving up competition. I see us sharing the bounty that we have with those who have too little. And there are forces in the in the dimensions that don't want us to have peace and they don't want us to have heaven on earth because there are energies that feed on fear and hatred. Fortunately, love is much stronger than dark energies. And so the more that we can stay in a state of compassion for ourselves and others and our thoughts and words and actions, the faster we're going to make all of these communication advances happen and the faster the consciousness that isn't raised on this planet can now begin to raise up and we're going to get there. If we don't, um, it's going to be a very sad future for this tough classroom called Earth. Well, we won't even talk about that because that won't happen. No. no. <laughs> well, I'm thinking of yeah. even 150 years ago, if you ever told somebody there'd be a, a radio, right? This little box that mm-hmm. there's music coming out of and things. And, and look how far we've progressed in such a short amount of time that the communications coming from them, learning in the halls of reunion, um, every, things do take time. You know, just because you cross over doesn't mean you're, like you're saying, all-knowing, all-wise, and you can just give a sign and, ta-da, I'm here. (laughs) Right, and we want it now. Of course we We want it all now. And that's like the people that, uh, I see a lot of clients that they're very frustrated because their friend got a sign from their loved one. It's their loved one, and the friend gets the sign yeah, and what's that they about? ask me why. Mm-hmm. I know, I know. It's a big. It's like probably one of my number one frequently asked questions. Well, the the dead community just like they're like water. They follow the path of least resistance. First off, it's easier for the deceased loved one to get the sign through to the friend because their grief is not so thick. The next reason is there could be a bigger master plan at work where if that friend gets that sign and then tells you, they're also going to tell 10 other people about this really cool, amazing experience they had. And one of those people may absolutely need to hear that to help them at a point in their life. Maybe they're very depressed or down. It gives them hope. So it increases the healing exponentially. And then finally, you can doubt yourself, not you. You don't doubt yourself. You trust yourself. No, You're so, where we want other people to get to be. Sometimes it, I do. <laughs> it, the sign gets come exactly. The sign comes to you, fully validated by your friend who can't believe that they got the sign. So the healing is moving forward exponentially to everyone that person tells, and there's probably a very special person that needed to hear it, and they wouldn't hear it from you because you don't know that person. There's all kinds of layers of the onion to this. Don't be angry if the loved one gives the sign of the dream visit to the family member. It's meant for you. Does that make sense? It does. My aunt, who I live with, uh, her co-worker's brother died of pancreatic cancer. And just devastating. Mm-hmm. He was in his late 40s, left yeah. behind two children. Um, anyways, just devastating. So my aunt had met the guy at one point. Um, but anyways, fast forward a couple months after he passed away, my aunt has this dream and this guy, Paul, is sitting on a park bench with her and they're in an amusement park and he's looking really healthy and like my aunt hadn't met him in his younger days, so but she knew it was him and I can't remember the name of the amusement park, but my aunt kept thinking they're in a place called, I think it was like Funland or something like that. And so she woke up and she's just like, gosh, that was weird. And it was so real. So she goes into work and she tells her friend, she says, I dreamt of your brother and I'm, I'm hoping this is comforting. Um, of course, my, Donna, my aunt lives with me and Donna and she's, you know, here's all my stories. But she's just like, I, you know, I, she never picks up on anything. But she's, she says, we, he and I were sitting in some amusement car, park called Funland. 
Well, Suzanne, when they were <laughs> oh, young children living in whatever state it was, whatever it wasn't here in Massachusetts, wherever they were, there was an amusement park called Funland that the parents no. used to bring them to. And it, oh, came through me, my, it. it came through my aunt, who's never seen anything. And she got to mm-hmm. bring that to work and just everybody in the office got goosebumps. Just really, really, I, really nice. That's so great. And, you know, and I, I would challenge people who are listening that to write these things down when they happen to you. Mm-hmm. Take, you don't have to journal, like, like I had a tuna salad sandwich for lunch or anything <laughs> like that. But, you know, I keep what I call um, an above the norm book. And I always have a little spiral notebook in my purse, too. And not for my clients, because that's a daily thing. But when yeah. something happens, special for me. Um, a loved one um, in the dead community, I write it down, I write the date and a couple sentences about what happened. And what will happen with people who do this is you will be able to look back and see patterns and trends and oh wows in how you're receiving information. And not only that, you'll, you'll have it right where your mind will forget details later, although the thing you just told me, I don't think that's forgettable. No, it's at not. All. That's amazing. Uh-uh. Yeah. Our, our minds, I find, and you probably feel the same way, they're you're thrown to want to be thinking negative things. I look up and look in the morning and, you know, I see the scale and the bathroom scale and I don't want to step on it because I'm afraid what it sees. And I see the grays creeping into my hair and I'm looking at myself turning 50 and it's negative, negative, negative. And then to do something like have the above the norm book and to be flipping through that going, no, no, remember Sandra, this is who you really are. And this is what it's really about. I mean, it can change your day and just even being grateful for things like, because we're so prone to be negative, I think, or lots of us are. Um, So I love that. Keep it, keep it. Yeah. There's a saying, I agree. There's a saying that, uh, a butterfly cannot see its wings. Therefore, it does not know how beautiful it truly is. Aww. We all have wings. We do. We all have our beauty. We all have our wings. And when people talk about having compassion, have compassion for others, have compassion for yourself first. Uh, it's like that saying, what do they say on the plane? If we lose cabin pressure, put on your own oxygen yes, mask first uh-huh. before someone else's, right? So the little things that you can do to remind yourself of how special you are to the universe and, and to yourself is really important. And I like affirmations. I like to put them in unexpected places where like if I'm going to open a file drawer or my checkbook, um, I can see you are amazing, you are talented, you are gifted. Um, It's important to do that for yourself because it does raise your vibration and that helps you with health and also manifesting abundance. Yeah, that whole real world is real as well, right? Manifesting energy, thoughts, creating things. Yeah, it's thoughts, words, and, and actions. I mean, I know a lot of people that have made a vision board and just thrown it in a drawer and then done nothing to make it come <laughs> to fruition, right? So I have one you know, of those. You have to yeah. get off your tail in, too, and yeah. make things happen. But thoughts, words, and actions. And in the morning, before you even get up in the morning, if you do a protection prayer and some gratitude, throw in the words and let compassion guide all of my thoughts, words, and actions. Hmm. Then you'll find that you'll start you meeting the right people at the right time. Compassion is for you. It's for others. You radiate this. You draw more of the same to you. Um, it's, it's a practice and a discipline rather than a one-shot deal. Yeah, I think that's the difficult part is making these things practices because we've all heard, the, you know, like affirmations I've been hearing about for 30 mm-hmm. years. And do you think I have right. daily affirmations? No. You think it would make a difference yeah. in loving ourselves? Yes. Yeah, and you only need one or two, and, and it's very, very simple. Mm. And then when you get tired of saying those one or two, find something else that mm-hmm. resonates for you. Rituals are very important, and, you know, we haven't talked about religion, and I typically don't mm-hmm. talk about religion. I, mean, I don't want to mess with anybody's values right. or their training or how they grew up. Um, I really talk more about the soul itself. 
But, you know, religion does teach us some valuable rituals. And I, my challenge to people is to create rituals out of your own spiritual practice because anything that you do multiple times, the intention gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So a, a, a practice of gratitude, but I can see the aura. As a clairvoyant, I have an edge. So I can see when someone first sits down in front of me, I can see the tight, nervous aura, and then I can see the um, happy, um, I feel connected aura, and the, t- the tight little dark aura of fear and doubt and worry you can blossom that into a beautiful, big light. And that beautiful, big light through your thoughts, words, and actions is what makes the manifestation happen. It's that energy that draws in what's better and better. So it's it's the words, but it's the feelings and the repetition, the practice, the discipline. Five minutes a day is all you need. That's it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I don't sit and meditate for hours. I'm busy. Um, <laughs> and people are like, oh, really? I just thought that. that. No, I'm busy. I can be ready to work in about 10 minutes. Um, and it's because of my discipline. It's because I do, I do my grounding and my protection and my gratitude and talking to angels and the feeling of the Christ consciousness and the plugging in. And I've done it for so many years that it's quick. And easy, and that's the problem with people who want to develop their intuitive abilities. They think I'm going to flip a switch sometimes and just turn on, turn them on to their um, inner voice, and then it's on. I'm like, no, you have to do the work, and you have to be consistent. But you can get yourself ready in five minutes a day if you keep it up. Mm. What do you mean by protection? You said that a couple of times. Yeah, I'm really big on being very grounded and protection, protected, and you can do that with, again, your intention. And I use grounding and protection prayers. I have one that's only um, it's about five minutes long. Um, I've made into a meditation called the Daily Peace, and you are cleansing yourself with your intention in divine white light. You're in a beautiful, translucent, golden bubble of protection. And you're sending out thoughts of gratitude and for your spiritual team. Each person on the earth has a spiritual team, which is a gift from a loving creator who knows that this is a very tough classroom, this earth, and wants us to have every advantage that we can. Um, And that spiritual team works behind the scenes, but you can learn how to work with them more up front to help you in your daily life. So for a protection prayer, if you know the Lord's Prayer, that's mm-hmm. said by millions of people, that's got powerful intention. It's a calling in Archangel Michael, powerful protection prayer, um, invoking the archangels to stand on your right, left, in front of you, behind you. Um, any poem or prayer that you love that resonates with your heart can become your daily protection prayer. You can say before you even get out of bed in the morning and start the day off right. That's all good news. It's easy stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's good news because it's simple. And we need simple and we need fast because we're in a fast-paced life. But we need to be consistent also. The dentist told me years ago, if I don't start flossing my teeth. Oh, no, he said, only floss the teeth you want to keep. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. and, and it it had me, like, really start flossing. And this may be a silly comparison, but... I know it's possible to change and put in a new habit. And not that I'm master of doing it, even though I do floss my teeth now. But I just, I think, like, there's there's a real good possibility we can do this. We really can. That's right. That's exactly right. And with f- things like our technology, we can have a little reminder go off in the morning. Like, don't forget, you, you know, you're say your prayer, your protection prayer, or gratitude statements or affirmations, things like that. Yeah, focus on what you do have, not what you don't have. Right. Suzanne, what should I ask you next? I'm looking at the time. I'm like, well, it's going by fast, and I want to make sure. How much time do we have? <laughs> well, <laughs> who you, 
you get to say, actually, you know, I don't want to have a three-hour interview, but uh, normally our... Oh, that's dangerous. I uh, you know. Well, we go on for a little while longer, though. I want to be mindful of everybody's I think time. But the, the main thing that I want to say to people is that you are not alone, and you're never alone. I do believe that you have privacy, that what's locked in your head or what is a private matter is all yours. But on standby, every single person has spirit guides who are highly experienced and well-trained and very loving um, subject matter experts. Some will be working with you for a season or a reason, depending on what you're going through in your life, like you get a new job. Mm. You may get one or two new job guides that are coming in and then, oh, you know, he's got this down. I'm going to go work with someone else. But everyone seems to have a consistent um, type of group of spirit guides that work with them. There's one main guide or master guide that knows the master plan of your life uh, and what you planned before you came and the broad strokes and coordinates the team. There's a guardian angel that's with you from birth to death that will help you. That's nice. And there's usually healing guides that are working with people too to help you heal yourself and help others to heal. And they are there not to interfere with your free will. When you're exercising your free will, they're like, okay, go on at it. But they're there to arrange those freaky dinky coincidences that seem to punk away, called synchronicities. And you can learn how to recognize their work in your life and you can learn how to establish a spiritual rapport with them if you so choose. But if you, nothing else, if, if you say, oh, I don't want to do all that training stuff and studying and practice, do me a favor and just next time you're saying prayers or affirmations, just say, I really want to thank my guides and angels for all the work you do behind the scenes because they're the most unsung heroes of the afterlife, don't you think? Yeah, well, yes. I wasn't even really aware of mine until we talked a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I, I've heard of them, but it's like, okay, mm-hmm. sure. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so is there a, something we can do to work with them right now? I mean, it's, I know we yeah. have our free will, but I'd also personally like to feel empowered that in some of the tough times that I'm not really alone, even though I might feel like I am. Well, that's a good point. Once you have your grounding and protection, whatever you decide to do, and if you need to Google this or go to my website, carefreemedium.com, and learn some more about it, your discernment is very important because when you open yourself up to spirit, you always want to have the intention, I'm opening up to the light. Okay. Because there's the light and there's the lack of light. And so I'm assuming everyone has that. It's not complicated or difficult, but it's important. And then in your meditation, before you start to meditate, write down on a piece of paper, I would like to meet with my spirit guides and make it an intention. I've found that writing is a great way to bring into the physical world the metaphysical element. It creates a, 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 like a consistency, a materiality um, a bridge, if you will. And anyone who's ever seen me work, even if I have an audience of 400 people, I have a pad of paper and a pen and I'm scribbling while I'm bringing in information. And then in the meditation, go to a beautiful place that you know well, whether it is your back patio or it's a park bench, but a place that you know because it'll be easier for you to visualize or imagine that place in great detail. Uh-huh. And then wait, just wait and observe when you feel uh, or sense or see in your mind's eye with your eyes closed, someone joining you, see if you can ask them what their name is, ask them if there's anything they want to share with you. And then after your meditation, make notes on that same piece of paper so that it's clear in your mind and you're getting it down. Make sense so far? Yes, it does. I want to okay. do it when we're done. <laughs> I bet you do. So now what do you do with this information? Well, let's assume 
that you've seen um, an appearance. You've seen hair, their face, or their clothing, or if you're real lucky, already you've gotten a name that they want to be called. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind that guides have had many, many lives, and they've had many names. They may pick a name from a favorite life or a name from a life where perhaps they knew you before. But once you get a name, it's really great because it gives you a shortcut. Like my guide is Leo Roy, my main guide, my master guide, and I call him LR. And I can remember, I'm writing about this too in the book, he was the little red-headed boy in spirit that walked with me to school as a kid if my best friend Lois wasn't going to school that day. And now he is the grown adult red-headed man. It's my guide. Wow. So I know he's been around for a long time. And I've had some of my students say, Man, the guy that I saw in the meditation looks like my imaginary friend from childhood. I'm like, well, there's a reason for that. Interesting. Now, I think it's pretty cool. How you learn to dialogue with this guide now is um, I'm going to challenge people that your best divination tool is an divination tool, I should explain, that would be like um, a pendulum, okay, for example. Mm -hmm. The word will go one way for yes, another way for no. That's great to work with that, and I do train people on that. But your best divination tool is your own physical body. Remember earlier when I mentioned you feel it in your gut or you feel it in your chest? Yes. Okay. So now I'm going to say I want to start... Um, let's say my guide's name is uh, Bob. So I'll say, okay, um, my intention for my next meditation went right down Bob. I want to know how I'm going to feel a yes or no response from you. And in your meditation, ask questions that you know the answer is yes to and that you know the answers are no to. You get a baseline of what yes feels like in your body and what no feels like in your body. And you may feel at other places. I've had, for example, I had a woman who would feel um, a tingle in her left hand was yes and a tingle in her right hand was no. And they'll be happy to give you their opinions. If they don't give you an opinion on something, it's because if you're at a point where you've already started taking some action or there's a life lesson you don't want to interfere with, you don't always get the answers, and that's an important thing to know. But And they don't know the future entirely. They can see a little ways ahead. Because remember, we said that no, you don't just go to the world of spirit and become all-knowing, right? Right. So consider them to be like a really close confidant and consultant. Okay. And you use them that way. Um, where they're not perfect, they're not 100%, but they really do care about you. You are their only client. So, oh, um, that sounds so yeah, special. So, it, is, it is special. It's, this, is a, this is a BFF in spirit whose only job really is you. The other guides are coming and going and they're supervising them. You also want to validate the guide. Did, have, have you ever done that? Nope. Okay. What do you mean? So with my students, I want you, you want to make sure it's not your imagination, right? Right. Okay. So a good validation exercise is, okay, so I'll say to Bob, all right, Bob, uh, this is an exercise. I want to validate that you're real. So I'm going to ask you sometime in the next two weeks to send me a, and then come up with, a deliverable for that and one of the common ones that we use is one yellow flower one red rose um something that they will manifest somehow to you you can't miss it it'll be so obvious uh, within a given time frame and they do and it comes in the most unusual ways sometimes then you'll know for your own benefit that you're not just um, hallucinating or making stuff up in your head and this works I've been doing it for many years with many students I love it Suzanne I've been seeing the number 333 or 33 or 3333 when I'm down when I need a reminder 
that this life isn't all there is, that there's a bigger picture. It is the weirdest thing. I could be driving and in a funk about something stupid, and then I glance in the car in front of me at a stop sign has 333. You know, it's like, oh, okay. Perfect. So I don't know who it is telling me, like, the little reminders. Uh, maybe it could be my spirit team, my spirit guides. But it is so amazing and uncanny when it happens. It, it's Yeah, it's crazy. great. I loved when they used numbers. In, in Doreen Virtue's um, angel numbers, mm-hmm. 333 means the ascended masters are working closely with you. All is well. You're right where you're supposed to be. Um and 333 can also just be your number. It doesn't always have to be looked up in an angel number book. And you said, I don't know who it is exactly. Mm-hmm. So um, I would ask that the next time it happens that you pause a beat, take a breath, and ask who. And the very first thing that comes to you, you can trust, whether it's a dad, whether it's a guide or your team. You'll get either an, an impression or a very clear, spontaneous thought will pop into your head and tell you who's doing this. I suspect it's the entire team, your guides, angels, and loved ones working in unison. Hmm. I would suspect the same thing. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. Oh, Susie. And, and I'm glad that you recognize that. Listen, there's people that are getting numbers and not noticing. Um, it's kind of frustrating, but it's, it's also possible it's just not on their path to be tuned in with the stuff. But by golly, the dead community will just keep at it. They'll keep trying. Hmm. Beautiful. I think looking at the clock, we should think about wrapping this up only because we want to be mindful of people's time. Oh, my gosh. Um, Before I say our our goodbyes to you, I want to remind our listener that our website is we don't die radio.com suzanne wilson is episode 87 and i encourage you to look at her gorgeous picture because she is one beautiful woman and i also have the links to some of the things that she's mentioned on the show today and her website carefreemedium.com and i'm going to be scouring that for some good things because suzanne i think you have some um meditations and things on there don't you I website? do. I have I have one uh, that is for connecting with your spirit guide that I just talked about. I have one for connecting with a loved one in the light, and then a couple more for manifesting health and serenity and abundance. Wow. Really good. Really, really, really good stuff. Um, and I also want to remind all of us, because sometimes the inner skeptic can kick in like oh my gosh is this all real and if you glance around wherever you are right now and just lay your eyes on something anything so i've got a coffee cup next to me with a glass of water in it everything is made up of energy science has proven that down to its inside its molecules there's atoms and inside the atoms there's you know protons neutrons electrons there's all this stuff happening and if we put a camera into one of the you know the tiniest of atoms there would be the camera wouldn't pick up anything everything is like this vibrating energy that's invisible and somehow out of that comes matter and even we're made up of energy this is not um science fiction this is just this is real stuff we are living in a land of the miraculous um we we get so used to having these wonderful comforts like the internet and our cell phones and radio and television not realizing that there's this invisible world of signals going on uh trust that in that invisible world your loved ones are there your guides are there angels are there like what we're talking about is real you are so much more powerful than you know yourself to be um Wow. Any closing words, Suzanne, now that I was on my high horse for a second? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love what you just said. Thank you so much. And it's an honor to have been on the show with so many great people that you've had on. But listen, folks, we're here for a very short time in the span of our eternal souls. Make the most of it. Know that you're not alone, that no life experience that you have is ever wasted. It all has meaning. And you are loved more than you can imagine. And thanks for having me again. You're welcome. And also you said you are never alone. I love that. Love, 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 love that. Oh, with that, we'll close the show. But oh, one last thing. 
back to we don't die radio.com um suzanne you reminded me of this just you know telepathically i guess i recorded an audio called how to survive grief a few years ago right after my dad died and it's been heard by tens of thousands of people around the world and even it's lifted people out of some pain helped them through grief and also it has prevented some suicides and so I offer it as just a free thing to listen to. No strings attached, no money to be given. If you know anybody who's lost a loved one, um, if you go to wedontdieradio.com and you click on the button that says Join the Insiders Club, you can listen to that audio. There's a free copy of my book, We Don't Die. There's other surprises in there. And, uh, and I just encourage you to use it because you are not alone. You are more powerful than you know yourself to be. Life is an education for the soul. Your life here on earth is important. I say all these things every episode, but I, I want you to know that it's the truth. And um, feel free to write us here too um, at Sandra at SandraChamplain.com. That'll, that'll get to me. And so this is Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to listen and to apply what we say to your life because I really am a stand that you have the best life possible and that you get your money's worth out of this time you're on planet Earth. So thank you for listening and we'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.